Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to a quick talk about a really hot topic in marketing. Everybody wants to be brave. It's a thing, right, right now. Brave is big. Now, if you've been here a couple of minutes ago to at the previous presentation, you saw someone who was really, really brave. And a lot of people listen to talks like this and they say, wow, that's probably not exactly me, you know. So and in marketing, there's a huge pressure to be brave. So I want to talk a little bit about the practicalities of being brave and what it means and what you could do. And in particular, what I like to do is uh, click to the next slide, in fact, which doesn't work. So um, why, why do we do this? You help me click to the next slide because the clicker doesn't work. So uh, when I do this, what we're all saying is, next. Could you do this for me? Okay, so next. Yes, how to be brave. That's exactly what I want to talk about. So now, here is the thing, right? Uh, everybody in marketing dreams of purpose. It's really big. I haven't met a marketer recently who hasn't spoken about purpose, hasn't spoken about the importance of it, who hasn't spoken about that they want to do something. In fact, as you probably have seen, there is even four-purpose water <laughs> nowadays, right? I mean, everything is purpose. There's a purpose chocolate bar, there's a purpose everything. It's really, really big. And what a lot of marketers have done, because they wanted to be involved in a purpose game, they have done things like this, the Heineken Open Your World campaign. You probably have all seen it. Uh, it was pulled, rightly so, because it didn't work. Zero impact, right? I mean, that's what happened with that campaign. There was, you probably have seen the, the Pepsi, Kendall Jenner campaign, your peace and unity. That's what Pepsi wanted to explain to people. What Pepsi was all about, all of a sudden, what well, you've seen what happened, right? It was zero impact. It didn't work. Uh, let me show you two purpose statements of brands. Um, the first says, we ignite opportunity by setting the world in motion. Um, the second says, we accelerate the advent of sustainable transport by bringing compelling mass electric vehicle cars to the market as soon as possible. Now, here are the two brands behind this. The, the latter is Tesla, the former is Uber. Now, Scott Galloway has done a really, really interesting analysis on a really funny chart. It's called Mission Statement Level of Bullshit versus Stock Performance for <laughs> One Year Post-IPO. And look what happens, right? That's what Tesla is, you know, with the much clearer, much more precise, much more sensible mission statement. So purpose is a really tricky thing. And in particular, if people are just using it for appetizing purposes or just to say something. We have too much purpose porn. Right? People are talking about it, but it's not, that is not what purpose is. And, and here is one of the problems. Right? Here is one of the big issues we see. Is that in, in a lot of companies, you know, when it comes to purpose, the CEO gives the things that matter to a department that's called CSR. Now, what are the attributes of a typical CSR department in a large corporation? That's right. No power and no budget. To cover up the sad reality, you know, there's a department supposedly in charge of good, and what they're doing is planting some green roofs. So it looks actually really, really good. That is not how purpose works. But let's talk about the imbalance we're seeing. And let's think about the real impact of a brand, the total impact a brand has, or a company or an organization. First off, there's financial impact. And everybody knows that, right? Everybody is, is very clear about this. There are reports about it. It gets shown, you know, if the finances are going really, really well, the company does well, the CEO gets promoted, it gets a big bonus. If not, you know, big problems, the CEO gets fired. I mean, that's how it works. But of course, there is human social impact, right? What does it do to the people who work there, with the society that the, the, the company operates in? And of course, there's natural impact. I don't need to explain this, but of course, we are aware that you know this goes, this can go both ways, and a lot of companies are actually borrowing um, on the on the natural side right now when it comes when you think about uh, this uh, the impact as a balance sheet. Now. If the financial impact go, can go positive, of course, everybody's happy. If it's negative, typically what you do is you fire the CEO and get a new one. Then, of course, there's the human, and I talked about as an inhuman and the, the natural aspect, which can go both ways. That's typically how these things work. Now, if you think about it this way, right, the total brand impact, you know, has different zones. It has the win-win zone. That's when everybody's happy, you know, financial, social, ecological impact, very positive. And of course, you have the disaster zone. When things go really, really badly wrong and the company is in the press. Now, I'll tell you what, people will worry a lot about these two extremes. The CEO will worry a lot about the win-win on the financial side 
And the CEO will worry a lot about the disaster because that's what you don't want to have. That's when the customers are really getting angry when you may lose money. You know what the problem is? It's that zone in the middle. You know, when you don't have disaster yet, but it's not great. And, and some people call it the Whitney zone. Do you know why it's called the Whitney zone? It's not right. Now, we can call the witness, it's, not, it's not, not fair to a witness to call the witness zone, she's done really nice things. So let's call, let's call it what it is. It's a zone of lies, right? That is when companies are doing things that actually you really don't want to be in a press, but it's kind of like still legal, and so you kind of do it, right? So I'll give you some examples, you all know them, tires, right? Did you know that, that plastic in tires is the largest polluter of, of oceans? Plastic polluter. It's crazy. We don't talk about this, right? We don't talk about this. I mean, I didn't know this since a couple of weeks ago when I saw someone showing the analysis. Um, you know, it's one of those typical, it's a zone of lies, right? We, it's, it's, it's legal, but we kind of like, you know, it's not a disaster yet, but it's somewhere in the middle. Um, I, have you seen this one? You check out at the Marriott Hotel and they ask you which currency you want to pay. Basically, what they're asking you is, do you want to pay 3% more for the convenience of us converting this to the currency you are more familiar with? Right? This is, they're basically luring customers into <laughs> conversion, right? inflated fees. It's a scam, that's it. It's legal, yeah? it operates in that zone of lies. Um, gig economy, right? you read a lot about this. Sounds, it's really, I mean, I love Uber, effective, because I love driving. I drive a lot of taxis, and it's great for me. Go on the app, there is a car. Now, there is, uh, you, you saw this, this has another side, right? There are people suffering because that's the only job they can get and it's difficult and so on. And there are many of those complaints and uh, I can't judge whether this is right or not, but clearly it has two sides. It's legal, it's partly in the zone of lies. You all saw the tax scandals, right? What companies are doing and are paying, you're trying to kind of move around the, um, the tax laws and basically, you know, trying to pay as little tax as possible. And the Starbucks was in the UK, of course, a huge deal, right? It was very, very widely published. You know, it, it, it's legal, right? It's just in that zone of lies where you don't want to tell your customers about it, right? You just don't want to do that, right? Um, don't want to do that. Um, now, I'm not blaming companies. Um, because you know what? The problem is when something is legal and you're not taking advantage of it, chances are that your economic performance will be lower, less than your competitors. And you know what shareholders tend to do when that happens? To just kick out CEO, get a new one in. Right? They're not saying, ah, oh, you're doing the right thing, you know, it's great, you're halving our profits for 10 years, thank you very much for doing that, you're doing the right thing. It's, not, not, it's currently not how it works. So I'm not blaming the companies. In fact, what the companies are, are often doing yeah, is similar to what, um, what I've experienced a lot. There's someone standing opposite to you, talking about purpose, having a smoke, and then, <laughs> then when they're done, right, they're just letting you fall down, and then they do this. And they're not picking it up again, it stays there. Now, that is, I mean, it's ridiculous, it's dirt, right? It pollutes the cities, the, the nicotine you know, gets washed out and, and animals pick it up. I mean, all these things are happening, right? It's that, it's, it's that a lot of people are doing it. You know, if you're not doing it, maybe you have to walk further, you know, you lose time. And, and, and there is that, like, everybody does it, right? So, and it's the same thing. That's what companies are doing, right? It's the zone of lies. It's not exactly right, but it's not, like, totally illegal. So it's somewhere in between. Now, tell you what, as a marketer, uh, or as an agency leader or as an executive who works in the space of customers, if you want to engage in purpose-related activities, chances are that you'll have to start in that zone of lies. That that's where you will find the things that a company can actually change. And if you really want to do this, um, you've got to be truly brave. You've got to be truly brave. Now, let me explain three ideas for what you can do if you actually really want to make a change in the organization you work for, perhaps in the clients you work for, and you really want to tackle something that's maybe in a zone of lies that you believe should change. First is, you got to shorten the money. Let me explain to you why that is. What do all brands on this chart have in common? Do you know? Big brands out there. 
many American brands. What do they have in common? All of them this year have fired their CMO. They have gotten rid of their top marketer, many times even not replacing them with a marketer in the first place. Just no marketer anymore at the top. Marketing is currently under a lot of pressure in the boardroom. There's a big struggle going on for relevance. And a lot of marketers in very uh, firms, even very senior marketers, currently don't have the access to the decision makers anymore. And there's partly, you know, many factors. But one of them is, of course, what marketers are doing, you know, to their own industry. And I, I thought about this recently, and I felt like if, if you were to give someone a task to destroy the reputation of marketing by inventing just one new term, well, why not invent performance marketing? which basically says everything else we're doing is not performing, right? It's just one of the many, many, many examples how we're destroying the reputation of our whole entire function that you know, in the good old days was product price place promotion. Now we're saying we don't want a little piece of it, which is promotion, but we're only taking the off the online part of it, and we're going to give that the title performance marketing, while the rest obviously does not perform, right? I mean, who, which brand manager would do this to their own brand, right? So I'm saying this not to, not to annoy you. I'm saying this to, to just make us realize that when you're starting out as a marketer, when you're starting out as an agency actor in a firm and want to make big change happen, purpose-related change that may not even be related to profit, you're starting not necessarily from the strongest position. It's just something to realize, right? I mean, they, they are not waiting for you to come. In fact, they may be really confused. In fact, they may just think all you want to do is spend more money on stuff that you like. I show this a lot, but we need to realize that unfortunately, fortunately or unfortunately, the very senior people in companies have pretty much two things on their mind. One is cost, one is revenue. It's, it's the reality, right? Now, then there is strategy and organization perhaps, but and, and, and you know, what, is, what happens when you are not revenue, when your idea is not revenue in, in, in the current times, right? For a lot of people, you will be automatically cost. And they don't like that. And that is the reality. Now, here's the problem. And Peter Drucker said this. You can't manage what you can't measure. And the big difficulty when you think about societal impact, when you think about ecological impact, that it's really, really hard to find a metric that a CEO genuinely cares about. Because if they get measured by profit, uh, it's, it's, it's just, you, you gotta, you got to really work hard to, to, I mean, that's the current world. I'm not saying that's, that's the right mindset. I'm saying that that is the mindset that they have. And you, as a change leader, want to get in there. So you have to, first of all, face the challenge that a lot of these things that we talk about are really hard to measure. And the good news is there are a lot of people currently working on systems that try to measure ecological impact, societal impact. It's not there yet, but we're working on this. So still, if you're really serious about making an impact, you've got to make the case. There's a proposal from um, Pavan Sukdev, one of the guys who works on these metrics that is trying to help CEOs to capture the impact of things that are not currently just in the P&L. And he talks about cost reduction. I mean, Marriott Hotels is globally now stopping to use these like single plastic shampoo bottles and things, right? You know, I think it's a good idea. Of course, it's a massive cost saving too, right? That case was really easy to make, in the, I'm sure, in the Marriott board. That wasn't a difficult debate, right? And then have some backups if you still want them. You can get them, right? That is a typical one where you say, you know, we have environmental impact and it's actually big cost saving too, and it's win-win. There is innovation value, right? There's a question is, could we come up with completely new products and services because we're pushing in a new area. There's a lot of green products out there that are, you know, capturing markets. There is risk reduction, of course. If we say, look, you know, we can do this for a little while, but it will get into the press. And if it gets into the press, here is what happened to other firms, right? That's a good case you could make. And there's, of course, the brand value question. Like, and brand value is a tricky one because for brand value, in the, eyes of, in the ears of a lot of CEOs sound like it's going to be good one day, I don't know when. 
That's what a lot of CEOs think when they hear brand value. But you can make the case, right? You could make the case when and how you could sell more because your brand has a better reputation. But you got to make the case. So that's the tip number one. I know it's hard, but try and make the case. Number two is you got to have a change leader mindset. Great marketers and great people who want to want to really take on the world are great change leaders. And you know there are some great barriers that you'll have if you want to purpose in your clients and your company. Right? If we talked about marketing's power, there are conflicting goals. There's short termism, and by the way, we may have a recession coming. Guess how how big the appetite will be to spend money on things that are unclear in terms of value. Um, here, this is an interesting, I love this chart. This is an IPA chart, and they, they looked at the effectiveness of advertising, and they, they figured out that ads becoming less and less effective, and the main reason is the shift to short-termism, right? Everything has to be faster, faster, faster. We want impact next week. You gotta know this, if you wanna do purpose work, there will be a lot of short-termism in your company that may be just in the way. I think we just need to be open about these barriers if you want to tackle them. So that's why when you really want to make something happen, you've got to make the case and you've got to be a changer. You've got to run around and mobilize people. And, and this is, by the way, is a great example, the story of, uh, of, uh, of Shirley Chisholm. She was the first black woman to be elected in Congress. The barriers she was facing were significantly higher than the ones I've just shown you. All right? She was facing like real barriers. So you, facing, you will be facing barriers too, but I think compared to what she had to face to get actually elected into Congress as a black woman, right? That's a real, you know, those are real barriers. So what do you need to do? Effective marketers are really good at mobilizing people. You have this idea. Maybe you want to you wanna change how much your company pollutes. Maybe you want to pay people better. Maybe there's something that you genuinely believe in. You need to start and mobilize. And great marketers mobilize teams. They mobilize bosses. They mobilize peers. But they also mobilize themselves. Marketing, proper marketing, is a 360 degree mobilizing job because if you have the aspiration to run the 4P, right, there will be lots of people involved and if you even want to make change happen for good, which is hard to prove, well, you got to be an even better mobilizer. Uh, if you want to learn, by the way, we're not going to talk in a lot of detail about uh, all the aspects of mobilizing. If you want to learn how this works, there's a book, we've written this about how you mobilize 12 powers of a marketing leader. Get yourself a copy, I get 50 cents each, so it makes you really rich when you buy this. That's how publishing works in 2019. But it's not that, it's more that you gotta learn how to walk the halls, how to make the case for change, because otherwise your ideal idea will simply get stuck. Here's my last point. If you really wanna make something happen that is bigger than your current work, you really gotta pick your battles. You can, you can be angry about a lot of things, you can be sad about a lot of things, but if you want to make change happen in any organization, you've got to really pick your battle. And the question is, where do you go? Well, you could be simple and pick making more revenue and profit for your firm. And you know what? It's okay. Because, you know, people will stay in jobs, the factories will keep running, they'll be keep hiring people. It's not necessarily a bad thing to help the firm, right? If you want to do more, of course, right, you could push harder and you could say, you know what, I'm going to focus on some of those things that we can't measure, that are harder to explain, that will be a longer and tougher uphill battle. And if you, if you want some motivation to go beyond financial, then you need to remind yourself that courage is purpose minus fear. If you want to be courageous, you can work on your fear, you can do that. But you could also say, you know what, there's something I genuinely believe in. It's not just something that sounds good, it's something that I would really, really fight for. And finding this, finding this will give you a lot more bravery. The two biggest challenges that need to be addressed are climate change and inequality. And frankly, they're closely related. We see that we're at the point where the cost of inaction is actually higher than the cost of action to the point that we're starting to ask ourselves the question, what the heck are we doing? And we're sleeping on the wheel. Although we're driving, we're clearly not driving fast enough. We're heading for three and a half, four degrees, and we're sitting here as if nothing happens. We're far behind on the global goals as well. Now, we might all be fine, but there will be a hell of a lot more people dying. There will be a heck of a lot more poverty in this world. I don't want to be responsible for that.
Anytime you know that you're polluting and put carbon in the air, there's someone else going to die. Anytime you know you're wasting food, there's someone else going to die. It is our problem. We're living on that same planet. And if we don't find a way to live in harmony with our fellow citizens, it's not going to work. We don't need more PhDs. We don't need more people to go to Pluto or Mars to find the answer. What we need is human willpower. And the simple question to ask ourselves is, do we really care? Ladies and gentlemen, we belong to the 2% of the world population that has won the lottery ticket of life. In the course of history, there comes a time when humanity is called upon to shift to a new level of consciousness. It clearly is the moment to do this. You're actually doing something for generations to come. You're a real leader. You're a real leader by simply bringing humanity back to business. My simple request to you is live a life with purpose. Thank you very much. Many of you know the person, this was Paul Pullman, see, uh, the CEO of Unilever, he stepped down a couple of months ago and became a full-time activist. So if you needed any push, that there's more than financial, perhaps that was useful. And here's why you have to be brave, because you'll see more of this. And if this is not for you, if this is not for you, if you are okay keeping the company running, then be brave enough to do this and not talk about the rest. And that takes bravery in marketing. And if you do believe there's more you can do, then pick your battle. There are enough reasons. And again, to do this, you will have to be brave. In any case, you will have to be brave. Thank you.